Hello, hello. Welcome back to my channel. This is another video on shear and moment diagrams, one of my favorite fun things to do. In this problem, we have a simply supported beam with two overhangs. We've got a roller support and a pin support at A and B. And then this little extension here, we're going to call both of those overhangs. And what we'd like to do is construct shear and moment diagrams. And the first thing we're going to need to do before we do that is figure out our reactions. Okay. Um, I will say that it's kind of maybe not a super common error, but sometimes there is an error where students will just be so excited to do the shear diagram, do the moment diagram, that they'll forget that the reactions are the first step. But they are absolutely required because we need our free body to be in static equilibrium before beginning um, any of our shear moment diagram calculations. All right, so I'm going to free my body from the support. And in order to do that, I'm just going to erase this support. I'm going to replace it with a vector. And I'm going to assume that that vector is going up. I'll call that a sub y. And I will also assume that this vector is going up. I'll call that one B sub y. And in terms of the interactions in this free body, kind of the big idea is that we're taking that bolt out. See how that used to be a pin connection? We're taking that bolt out yellow isn't an exact match, but close enough for our purposes, and replacing it with the effect of the support on the body. So we'll leave it looking something like that. Okay, we freed our body from the supports. We have our reaction, um, our reaction forces shown symbolically, and let's do our equations of equilibrium. Um, you'll get to the answer fastest by doing your moment equation first. So I'm going to do a moment summation about A, set that equal to zero. All right, how many terms do are we going to have in my moment summation about A? One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. We're going to need to break this up into seven pieces. Before we set up that moment summation, I'm going to go ahead and change that line load. So we have a uniformly distributed load or line load over four feet. And then we have one of these triangular loads over the last six feet. And what I am going to do I am going to change those into forces instead. Now, be careful about this. We can change this into a resultant force for the purpose of our reaction calculations. But when, we, when it's time to do the shear moment diagrams, we have to go back to this to this distribution, OK? So we only do this little activity that I'm doing right now, turning these into a resultant force. We only do this for the purpose of getting the reactions. All right, so I've got two kips per foot over four feet. That gives me eight kips. And for the little triangular piece, I'm taking the area under the curve. So two kips per foot times six feet, that's 12 kips. And then divide by two because it's a triangle and we'll get a sip, six kip load there. All right, let's set up this equation. just right. Okay, 
summation of moments about a is equal to zero. All right, first term, eight kip feet. That one is positive counterclockwise. Next term, 10 kips. That's at a distance of two feet from A. That one is positive counterclockwise. Eight kips times feet. That one is negative clockwise. Next term, 16 kips. That one is four feet away. And it is negative clockwise. Next term, eight kips at a distance of two plus two plus half of four is two. So that's going to be two times three or six feet away. And that rotation is again clockwise or negative. Next up, um, I'll do this one. I'll do B sub Y last. And so I'll make that six kips distance from A. Okay, we're going to go let me erase this so I can kind of redo it again. All right, from A, let's add it up. Start here, two, four, eight, plus a third of six. So eight plus two is 10 feet. Okay, um, and that one is a clockwise or negative rotation. Um, our last term, B sub Y, that one is what, eight feet away from A. And that one is counterclockwise or positive tendency to rotate about A. All right, let's spot check this and make sure that this expression makes sense. Do I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven terms. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven terms. Okay, good. Are all the units of my terms correct? Yes. Okay. I usually for a problem that's got this much stuff in it, I usually pause here and also check all of my signs. And I'm kind of scanning it quickly and everything is looking good. So what I'm going to do here is simplify and kind of put this in my calculator. And the first thing I note is that I do have equal and opposite eights. So I'm just going to get them out of the calculator. And so I just say 20 minus 16 times 4 minus 8 times 6 minus 6 times 10. Figure out what that is. Throw it on the right side of the equals. So just multiply it by negative 1 and then divide by 8. Do try that on your own. You can pause the video and you should get B sub Y is equal to positive 19 kips. And that positive sign just means that the direction that we drew on the picture, our assumption is correct. So we could say 19 kips upward. To get A sub Y, we could either do another moment summation. Um, I'm going to choose to do a force equilibrium equation here. So summation of forces in the y direction is equal to zero. Assume a sub y is upward. And let's do our little accounting again. I've got to think about this and try to clean this up a little bit. But I may not be able to get everything. Let's see. Well, okay, <laughs> that's okay. 
is not the most professional YouTube channel that's out there. Please be forgiving and kind. All right, so we're going to assume a sub y is up. How many terms are we going to have? I'm just going to switch to a different color here. We're going to need this force, this force, three, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And I'm going to do my little thing where I'll put everything going up on the left, everything going down on the right. So um, all the forces are vectors in the positive y direction. I've got my unknown a sub y. I've got my b sub y, which we solved to be 19 kips. And every other force is downward. So hit the equal sign. And that would be 10 kip downward plus 16 kip downward plus and this is the one that's kind of got colored over here, but this will be my eight kips. So four times two. So that'll be an eight kips downward plus a six kip downward. One, two, three, four, five, six. I've got all six terms. Spot check the signs. Everything looks good. Um, so run that through your calculator and you'll get a sub y is equal to positive 21 kips. That confirms our assumption that a sub y points up just like that. Okay, I'm going to turn that layer off and turn on a grid. I'm going to turn this layer off. Okay, let's just get the right values in here so that we have them. We had said that a sub y was 21 kips upward. Sometimes I put a little hatch over the vector to show that it is a reaction and not, a, not an applied force. And b sub y we solved as 19 kips upward. There we go. All right, now that we've got our reactions done and quite a bit of work to get there, we're ready to do shear and moment diagrams. Okay. Our general procedure works something like this. We want to label our plots. The first plot will be our shear diagram. That is one integration from our free body. And then we'll get our moment diagram that is a second integration from our free body. Let's go ahead and put the units into the plot so that we don't have to label every value. My shear force will be in kips, unit of force. My moment force times distance, that'll be in units of kips times feet. Okay, let's do the shear diagram first. We start at zero, zero right here. We move from left to right and we want to end at L comma zero. All right, for the first two kips, I have zero shear force. So keep that at zero. Let's jump down by 10. Jump up by 21. That gets us over here. Now we need to jump down by 16. So 11, subtract out 16. That lands me at negative 5. Over the next 4 feet, I want to decrease by 2 kips per foot. So I'm at negative 5, subtract out 8, or 2 times 4. That gets me down to right about there, negative 13. So minus 5 minus 8 is minus 13. I'll mention again, I think I say this in every video, um, I don't put negative signs on the points that are plotted negative because I think that the plot is self-evident. I know some people like to put negative signs there. That is fine. It's okay either way with me type of function do we need? Well, load was constant. When you integrate a constant function, you get a linear function just like that. OK, 
Okay, now we're ready to jump up by this reaction, minus 13, and then we increase by 19. That puts us at positive six, which is about right there. Even though I don't have a grid, you will note that I'm trying to draw these to scale, positive six right there. Even though I don't have a grid, I'm trying to make a good faith effort to draw these dimensions to scale. So I'm just kind of eyeballing relative distances, trying to draw in proportion. I find that to be enormously helpful. Um, if you need graph paper to help you with that skill, skill, definitely do it. But even if you don't have graph paper, try to be in the ballpark. Okay, for the final three feet, is that three feet? Oh, no, final six feet. For the final six feet of the member, we need to decrease by two times six divided by two. So 12 divided by two is six. So that's gonna get us back to zero, positive six minus the, the area under this curve, that's going to get us back to zero. And then the question is, how do we get there? We see that our loading function is linear. And so we know that this function is going to be quadratic. But the million dollar question is, which type of quadratic function will it be? Is it going to be this one, concave up, or is it going to be that one? concave down. Here's my recommendation for how to figure that out. Okay. The arrows can be tricky due to the principle of transmissibility. The principle of transmissibility says, I've got a knock on the door. I'm going to pause this and come back in just a minute. Okay, I'm back. I think I was talking about the principle of transmissibility. And what that means is that a force applied to a body can be moved along the line of its action without changing the effect of what it does to the body. So this force and this force could um, mean exactly the same thing. And if we put that in the context of our little line load here, here's what you could run into this pink function pushing down on the top fiber of the beam is exactly the same thing as these orange fibers hanging down from the beam. Okay, so we can express this idea in both of these two ways. And if you are not careful, if you are not careful, you can look at this function versus this function and come to some very opposite conclusions as to what needs to be going on in your moment diagram. So here is the way that I recommend that you deal with this particular little conundrum. When you have a loading function that varies over distance, such as our little triangular load, uh, two kips per foot here. Here's what I suggest that you do. We know that the, we know that if we integrate the free body, we get to our shear diagram. And therefore, if we take the derivative of our shear diagram, we get back to our loading diagram. What that means, just kind of basic calculus uh, refresher here, is that since the value of the load intensity at x equals L is zero, that means the slope of the shear function has to be zero, okay? Over here at x equals L minus six, whatever that is, we have a two kips per foot downward, um, downward load intensity, okay? And so we need to be able to turn that into a slope. If I go, half the way across, I still have a downward load intensity, a negative slope. But here, let me try that again. 
it's exactly half of the slope as it was at the prior point. And you can start to kind of stitch this together and use that type of calculus-based analysis to deduct that the correct curvature, or I shouldn't say curvature, the correct concavity for the moment diagram is quadratic concave up as shown here. Okay, that took a long time to explain. I'm going to draw that in pink because I want to. Draw that a little closer to reality, something like that. Okay, let us go down to the moment diagram. We're going to be able to directly integrate the shear diagram with two exceptions. We're going to need to remember to jump eight kip feet here and jump eight kip feet here. And it's easy to forget that when you're in the middle of your moment diagram. So as a little reminder, I'm just going to kind of remind myself. I'm going to circle that plane. I'm going to circle this plane and jump, jump. And I'll even give myself another little clue in terms of what direction I'm going to be jumping. A clockwise direction means jumping up. This one is clockwise, so that one jumps up. A counterclockwise direction is all about jumping down. So I'll add that to my notes down below. And this is a rule, by the way, that works 100% of the time, OK? So um, clockwise means jump up in your moment diagram counterclockwise means jump down and if you're having trouble remembering that a little memory trick is as follows here is a little person do 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 beautiful completely normal proportion person and here is a clock on the wall that's how you remember clockwise jump up. Here is like a kitchen counter that is below the clock. That's how you remember counterclockwise jump down. Clockwise jump up, counterclockwise jump down. Okay, down and up. So this one will be down, jump up, and each will be a magnitude of eight. Um, we know we're going to need the areas from our shear diagram. And what I think I'm going to do is zoom in. <clears throat> and just kind of do these areas kind of directly on the, the picture. I need to zoom out, I guess, to get the dimensions up at the top. All right, so this little area here. Call that area one. It's equal to 10 times 2 equals 20. I think I'm going to get a thicker pen so you can see this a little better. Here's another rectangle. Actually, we're going to have to split this one into two. Because remember, we're going to have to jump. So I'm just going to do these separately. So this is 2 times 11. That's an area of 22. This is also 2 times 11. That's an area of 22. This one is an area of 20. For our trapezoid, we want to take the average height, the average height, and multiply it by the base. So I would do 5 plus 13 equals divided by 2 equals, that's the average height, times 4 equals. So that's going to be 36. That's faster than separating out the um, rectangle and triangle separately. And then how about over here? We have the area underneath a quadratic function. And 
we know that this distance is six. Let me double check that. Yes, okay. That distance is six. And so this area, what we want to do is look at the bounding box. So here is the bounding box for this function. And since this is a pure quadratic function in terms of x squared, I know that the little piece, which is the piece I want, is equal to one third of the area of the bounding box. Okay, if I needed this other piece up here, which I don't, that would be two thirds the area of the bounding box. And our bounding box has a height of six, it has a base of six. And so our area is going to be equal to 12 uh, kips times feet. Okay. We are ready to do our moment diagram and finish this problem up. Let's do it. Okay, start at zero, zero, and right away, due to that applied moment, I want to jump down eight, jump down eight. For the next segment, I have zero shear, so that means constant moment, no change in moment. Over the next segment, I want to decrease by 20. So nine, minus eight, minus 20. That takes me down to 28. So let's try to draw this to scale. It's going to come pretty far down here. Oh, that's not right. So I need 20 more dun, 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 about there. How am I going to get there? Well, shear was constant, therefore moment is linear. Over in the next section of the beam, I want to increase by 22. Minus 28 plus 22 gets me up to negative 6. Try that one more time. There we go. Now we're ready to jump up 8. We're at minus 6 plus 8. That lands us positive 2. Now we're ready to increase by 22 more. That puts us at 24. Let's see. Way up here. How are we going to get there? Again, linear. And next up, we decrease by 36. So positive 24 minus 36, that gives me down to negative 12. About here, I think. Pretty close. Yeah, close enough, close enough. Negative 12. And I'm going to finish, before I start messing with the types of functions, let's just finish this out, OK? And this is a good strategy to do this like point by point and then come deal with the nature of the functions, because that way, if you don't get back to 0 at the end, you know you've got a mistake to fix regardless. It can save you a little bit of time. So I'm at minus 12. My last area is positive 12. So I will come back to 0. That is a requirement for each and every moment diagram, each and every shear diagram. It works like that because of equilibrium. And now we just have two functions to figure out. OK. This portion of the curve, two ways to do this. There's the easy way, then there's the math way. So if the person is walking down the hill, that means that my moment function is concave down. Okay, if the person is walking down the hill from left to right, your subsequent function, your moment function will be concave down curvature. Note that right now we are in a pure mathematical view of these values. 
we no longer have to second guess this the way we did with the arrows, because with the arrows, the principle of transmissibility can lead you to make incorrect conclusions. Once you get past that loading diagram into the shear diagram, you can use this shortcut method. If you're having trouble with that or just want to spot check, here's how to do it. The value is negative five of the shear diagram. My instantaneous slope, my instantaneous slope is negative five in my moment diagram. Okay, so the slope of that line is negative five. Over here, my slope is negative 13. So that's a steeper slope. Is this slope steeper? It absolutely is. Slope negative 13. So that's another way that you can use basic principles of calculus and the idea of taking the derivative of a function to make your shear moment diagrams line up and have great success in getting them absolutely correct 100% of the time. And that's the goal. I want you to get these 100% correct 100% of the time, really minimizing any errors, any misconceptions. That is the goal. All right, our last little bit of the puzzle is this function. And at this point, you start to see really how important it is to label these things. So I'm going to label this one as quadratic parabolic is okay too. Oops, that one I already labeled as quadratic. So down here, I know I'm going to have a cubic function. Okay, so I'm thinking cubic already. My area is positive, so I'm increasing. I've already got these two points, so we just need to figure out the nature of the cubic function. And as before, there are basically two options, right? You can have concave up, concave down. Those are your two options. You can do it the easy way or the mathy way. Here's the easy way. Here's my little person standing on the curve. As they go left to right, are they going up or down? They are going down. So the moment diagram has to be concave down. Okay. The other way to look at that, I'm going to draw that one more time, get a little bit closer. There we go. That was good. That one's pretty good. So that is the correct answer. That's the correct curvature. But again, if the person running down the hill is throwing you off, you know, use principles of calculus. So up here I have a positive six value. That means that here, that is a positive six slope. I have a zero value. That is a zero slope. Okay. Awesome. I hope this video was helpful and maybe even delightful. I can always hope, right? Thanks for tuning in.